1129 through 1230. The Call of Abram. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Now Sarai was barren. She had no children. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Sechem, to the oak of Moriah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The word of the Lord. Last night, I had a vision. It came on me unexpectedly. Suddenly, I had nowhere to run. I, I had nowhere to hide. But this vision penetrated me deeply. I, I am still in awe. This God said to me, and I remember this clearly, Abram, go, leave this country, leave this land, leave your father's family, and go to a land that I will tell you. What is God wanting of me? I have no reason to leave. We, we live on my father's land. We are, we are established here. Our cattle finally have pasture. Water is readily accessible. My household is happy. It would be ridiculous to leave. In a real struggle, I argued with God. I, I fought. I, I don't want to leave. My home, my security is here. I know no other land. Yet this God calls me to an unknown, unnamed land. I fear the enemy. Who is out there? On whose land will I walk? On whose land will I settle? I cannot trust the stranger. I cannot want to live in another land, yet God calls me to go. Again, I argued strongly, wanting explanation, wanting answers, guidance, direction, something anything to hold on to. I stood perplexed. I felt misunderstood. I, I demanded angrily, how? Why? Why me? What right do you have to demand this of me? Why should I leave everything I know? Why should I leave my neighbors, my friends, all of the people I love, where will you be? I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Never before had I felt such a firm grasp. Never before had I been in such awe, in such a presence. I felt compelled to act. I felt led to go. I feel a trust in this God. Although I live in fear and uncertainty, I feel an unprecedented directing force. My heart is heavy yet I am willing. O oh God, whose power overcomes me, who overrules all my objections and captivates my soul, 
who now lifts me up from this place to go and move on. I place my trust in you. Lead us. Protect us. Go with us, God. So we'll go with you, choir. Will you pray with me? So God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight as we seek to draw near to you and always to hear from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So the first 11 chapters 
in the book of Genesis are very broad. They recount the early history of all humankind. God is dealing with the whole world, creating it and being active in it. But almost right away, we get the sense that things haven't gone according to plan. In Genesis chapter 3, just three chapters into the story, brokenness and disobedience come into play, and Adam and Eve defy God and get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. By chapter 4, violence enters the story of human history, and Cain kills his brother Abel. It's a mess already, just four chapters in. Because of this, Scripture says that the flood is necessary to cleanse the world. The flood comes, and all life is blotted out, except for Noah's boat bobbing up and down on the water. When the water recedes, Noah hops out of the boat and builds an altar. He makes a sacrifice, an offering to God, and God smells the pleasing aroma, the Bible says, and then announces, never again will I curse the ground because of humankind, even though, even though, God says, the inclination of the human heart is often bent towards evil. In other words, the flood didn't change a thing. Humans will continue to do terrible things to each other, but God's approach to the world does change. As Professor John Holbert puts it, God begins to withhold divine anger in the face of the terrible shortcomings of human creatures, and that, my friends, is what we call grace. Brokenness isn't God's intention for creation. God wants to restore creation and humanity to its founding vision, which is wholeness and peace. So God changes God's approach to the world after the flood. In Genesis chapter 12, our passage of scripture for today, there is a shift in the story, a break in the narrative. It changes and the lens zooms in on this one family, Abraham and Sarah. God is gonna use this family to help put the world back together again. So for the next six weeks or so, we're gonna be talking about Abraham and Sarah and their story in the book of Genesis. And I encourage you, you will get a lot more out of the series if you read the story for yourself. It's found in Genesis chapter 12 through 24. And also we have a few uh, copies out in the hallway of the novel version of the story if you're interested in reading that as well. Their story is filled with great faith and colossal failure. I mean, wait until next week. Uh, the title of the sermon next week is The Best Husband Ever. Despite their flaws, God, of course, uses Abraham and Sarah. The moment they say yes to God is really a defining moment in all of human history because over half the people of all the earth today look to Abraham and Sarah as the father and mother of their faith. Twelve million Jews, two billion Christians, and one billion Muslims trace the foundation of their belief back to this encounter of God with Abraham. When we're introduced to Abraham and Sarah, uh, they are in their mid-70s. Much of their life is behind them. They're living in Ur, which is in modern-day Iraq. They're living in a polytheistic culture where people worship many deities. They're minding their own business, just living their life, and seemingly out of the blue, really, God says, there they are, and he chooses them. God speaks to Abraham in a very personal way. We don't know how the communication came. We don't know if God spoke to him in a dream or a vision or perhaps just an inner voice. But somehow God gets through to Abraham. God speaks to him and says, pack your bags and go. The enormity of the request that God makes is expressed through a threefold listing of what Abraham must leave behind 
to follow God. Leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's house. In other words, leave everything, your ethnic group, your extended family, your basis of security and identity, leave it all, God says, and set out for a land that I will show you. This must have been an undeniable encounter with God. It would have taken that for Abraham to follow. Abraham apparently senses this great call with all of his being, this great love beckoning him, and he just gives up everything to go. No wonder scripture talks about over and over and over the faith of Abraham. As God calls Abraham and Sarah to go, God makes these incredible promises to them. I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. There are huge implications behind these words. Great can mean large, but it can also mean important, essential, significant. The promise is to create from their offspring a great nation. From this nation, through this family, all the people of the earth will be blessed. So the blessing isn't just about heaping good things on this one family. No, it's through this family that all of us will receive a blessing. These promises are key to the entire Bible. God is going to work through this couple and their family to bless the whole world. It's an incredible announcement, a declaration of how God is going to work in the world from this point on. Through this family, God is promising to form a nation, Israel, to bear God's promise. God is calling an alternative community into being. Incredibly, God has given Abraham and Sarah and their descendants, the people of God, the task of working alongside God to put the world back together again, to be a blessing to the whole earth. There's only one tiny little problem. There are no offspring. How can you be a great nation without offspring? The first thing we learn about Sarah beyond the fact that she is Abraham's wife is that she's barren. It's a cryptic reference. Just one little line. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Wouldn't you love to be introduced that way? Meet Sarai. She's barren. I don't like the word barren. As most of you know, because I've talked about it, Michael and I have personally dealt with infertility. So as someone who has gone through infertility treatment, can I just tell you how much I loathe the word barren? Scripture compares Sarah's womb to a desert wasteland. No offense, but this had to be written by a guy, right? <laughs> it's a barren wilderness in there. Dry, dusty, empty, no possibility for life. Unfertile, unproductive, desolate. It's barren. Today, lots of people choose not to have children. Being the parent of two small kids, I can understand why sometimes. <laughs> But for Abraham and Sarah, having children isn't just about the joy of parenting. In Scripture, children are seen as a sign of God's blessing, and not having children is seen as a sign of God's displeasure. In their day, having children is also important for economic reasons. People have children to help with the work and to ensure that somebody will take care of them in their old age. It's important. But Abraham and Sarah have no children. If I were going to write the history of God's people, I would begin with a much more positive storyline. But what we get is Abraham and Sarah, a couple in their 70s with no children. It doesn't sound very promising, does it? But as I've learned, as the parent of two amazing adopted children, barrenness is where God does some of God's best work. 
When things seem dry, dusty, empty, God has plenty of room to work. From this point on, in Scripture, God will work through the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, both biological and spiritual, to bring about wholeness in the world. All the families of the earth will be blessed through them. Fast forward to the New Testament. In the book of Galatians, Paul writes, If in baptism you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise, the blessing that God places on Abraham and Sarah is transmitted to us through the person of Jesus Christ. The message version of the Bible puts it this way. Since you are in Christ's family, then you are Abraham's famous descendants, heirs to the promises. The key is that those who have faith in Christ, those who belong to Jesus, are full members of God's family, Abraham's heirs. The church, of course, has always understood herself to be grafted into this blessing of Abraham and Sarah through Christ. We're called to be that alternative community, God's people, a blessing to the whole world, which means the purpose of the church is not just to maintain herself or just to survive. The purpose of the church is to help the world thrive, to be a blessing. Let us never forget that. God calls Abraham and Sarah to follow, and the call is part invitation, part promise. From the outset, they're blessed because they're given this identity as God's beloved, God's chosen people, which is what we are, church. But God's blessing is not just a one-shot, one-time thing. Abraham and Sarah have to claim it. They have to live into it. The promise requires action, a decision on their part. They have to pack up their things and say goodbye to their family and follow God, which is no easy task. So over the next few weeks, we'll see them accepting this blessing and not being afraid and really living into the blessing. They have incredible faith. And over the next few weeks, we'll also see them get anxious and veer off the path, way off the path. Colossal failure. We often ask the question, can we trust God? Is God trustworthy? It's a question Christians think about a lot. But the story of Sarah and Abraham raises a different question. Can God trust us? God wants to bless the whole world through Abraham and Sarah, through us, their heirs. Can God trust us? In a moment, we're going to stand and sing a hymn about divine grace in the face of human failure. If you'll take your hymnals, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, hymn number 45. As we stand and sing this morning, I'll be here at the front if anyone needs prayer. If you're interested in becoming a part of the First Baptist family or getting baptized, I'd love to talk with you. Let's stand and sing together. Come thou found. 